Well, good evening. I'm Barry Corey. I've just begun my 14th year uh, as president here at Biola University. Uh, moving here from our hometown in Boston with our young family when I was 45 years old. And Paul and I now have uh, two Biola graduates as children and one rising senior. And tonight I, I know I'm talking to quite a few parents out there um, as well as quite a few students. And I just wanna thank you for joining us on this call. We have a number of Biola leaders uh, to help answer some of your questions. And we've had many, many questions that have been submitted for this evening's town hall. And we've batched them into the most common themes. So we hope to cover the majority of what you are longing to know. I'm just gonna begin with a word of prayer, if you don't mind, let's pray. In the spirit of God, um, we welcome you into this conversation. You know, like, like Solomon of old, uh, we plead for wisdom. We pray spirit comfort us, spirit guide us, spirit anoint us and help us in the murkiness of this moment, which we are all experiencing to believe that we will one day, hopefully soon, see what you are up to in the sovereign work you are unfolding before our very eyes. We commit this conversation to you, Lord Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, one of you moms uh, sent me uh, earlier last week, actually, I just received it a few hours before announcing our decision for the fall, just a little bit about perspective on making this decision. Here's what uh, Caroline wrote to me um, and actually to other leaders through me here at Biola. She said this, I wanted to let you know that there are many, many parents praying for you as you make the decision about the 2020-2021 school year, you are not alone. We are all there in the trenches with you, concerned for the physical health of our children, for our sons and daughters, mental health during this pandemic, for our sanity as we try to remain steadfast during the unknown, we are there. If you could see the outpouring of prayers and support going up for you on Eagle's Nest Bio University Parents Chat Facebook group, you would feel the unsureness that we all feel moving forward with whatever decision is made. If we send our children, will their health be compromised? If we don't send them, will their mental health be impacted? There's no right or wrong answer that anyone can make as a human, but you are wrapped in the love of God's arms and we all feel the weight of the decision on your shoulders. Please know that not only are you wrapped in God's arms, but also in the majority of the parents' arms as well, lead uh, by faith. I just wanna thank you for uh, praying for us and praying with us. I know many of you have been doing just that, but I also want you to know we've been praying for you. And I think you know that we've been having a prayer campaign. We do this every year, praying by name for every single new incoming student to Biola. This is what we do. There are 10 uh, names that I have that I pray for there right here, and I'm praying for you. And we've been serious as a university for 112 years now that we are going to make prayer a priority. You know, a lot has changed uh, since our last live video town hall that we had together back in June. It's, it's changed in the state, it's changed in our country, it's changed at Biola. California COVID situation uh, turned uh, for the worse in mid-July. And as it did, things tightened up in California. I know you are disappointed uh, that we're unable to be in person as we start the fall uh, semester, August 31st, but I want you to know we are too. And I am sitting with you in grief, knowing that this is one more disappointment in the long string of disappointments that we're experiencing because of COVID. So to state the obvious, uh, it's truly been a difficult season uh, for Biola, wrestling through the options and decisions in light of COVID. So last Tuesday, having received no green light, or for that matter, no yellow light, uh, from the state or county to move forward with classroom instruction and residential learning, we made the difficult announcement that we would begin the fall semester with remote instruction. I'm gonna share more about the implications of the government delays during our Q&A, but uh, let me just mention right now that we have to follow local health guidelines. And for us, that's local health guidelines come from the LA De County Department of Public Health. And they can't issue guidelines to us and they unless they have guidelines from the state. So it's been a frustrating season of silence in Sacramento as it relates to how and when colleges and universities can reopen the entire state, public and private both. And for months, you know, we've been ramping up our preparations for any number of scenarios that came our way. And our default was gonna be on the ground uh, learning come August 31st, but we've been making all of our plans and doing all of our readying 
so that we can prepare for your health and your safety, as well as to advance the academic quality of our university. And, and we've been doing that. We have new classroom technologies. We have a stronger IT infrastructure. We have ample health and safety uh, supplies and even more. Uh, our faculty is preparing to start this semester much more uh, equipped than they were just a few months ago. So we are ready for you students. I want you to know that, not just in the classroom, but we're ready for you new students to onboard as well. We have dozens and dozens of events scheduled from now through the end of August. We're, they're designed to engage many of our students' interests and backgrounds and passions and tastes. And, and these include the new student welcome experience, sessions for transfer students, open houses at our nine schools. We have career skill workshops, roundtable discussions, and on and on it goes. You'll have plenty to do even from a distance. And we'll keep you all informed so you don't miss out throughout the whole next few weeks process. And, and before you know it, you'll be in your classes and learning from these incredible professors. I met with these incredible professors last Tuesday. Uh, they've been amazing and working diligently to make the most out of this situation and doing online instruction and remote learning. And, but they've built on what was learned over the spring and summer. And I'm confident, I'm confident that our outstanding faculty will deliver great courses remotely until we resume in person. So, so that all students, you'll be able to stay on track towards your Biola University graduation. And let me just say again, we've come a long way since March, not only in our faculty, but in our support services as well. We've been fine tuning our co-curricular programs to develop students even remotely pastoral care services, academic advising, the Biola Counseling Center, peer coaching, internship and career networking, student success coaching, and many other services will be available in online formats until we come back to campus. And I've been incredibly impressed with the creativity and the innovation of this community to ensure that Biola continues to grow and develop our students beyond just academics during this COVID crisis. And I know we're gonna get through this and we're gonna get through this by God's grace. We continue to work hard, we continue to trust in him and that trust spurs us to action. So I keep this uh, ceramic uh, right nearby my desk here at Biola and I'm on campus right now. I picked it up at a retreat center near my hometown in New England earlier this year. It reads, uh, Ora e Labor, Latin for uh, pray and work. And I, I want you to know that we are praying hard, but we are also working hard, getting ready for you to come. And I know we live in uncertain times. And this is just one more faith moment for God's people to plan well and trust in him. It really is. And we will never in this life be immune from uncertainties, right? In ourselves, in our families, in our work, in our world, at our university. But all along, the good news is uh, we continue to have this once for all confidence in Christ, our rock, our hope, our salvation. I was in a conversation with our board chair uh, last Tuesday, and he shared with a number of us after we made the decision. He said, here's the good news. God has not been caught by surprise. He is still leading. The faculty and staff have prepared well for this unwanted situation. We have invested money to deliver remote learning at a higher level than most other institutions. We have faculty and staff that will invest in our students' lives during the most significant health crisis of 100 years. This semester, thousands of students will be equipped in mind and character to impact the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. And who knows what the Lord might do through this group of students. We are being required to live the life of faith. We say we should live, but try to avoid. God is with us. Those were words from our board chair. So our commitments haven't changed during this pandemic. To stay faithful to our Christ advancing mission, to preserve and protect the health and well-being of our community, to deliver a quality, uncompromised educational experience, building off well over a century of holding paramount the mission of Biola University. And there could be no better time than during this COVID pandemic to be part of a Christian university like Biola, where students are, are encouraged to, to live into their passions, to bolster their faith, to mature their biblical worldview, to sharpen their minds, to build lifelong relationships in the midst of such a trying season. This is a unique time and we cannot and will not refuse to squander it. And we're gonna get through this. And we're gonna be better on the other side. And the best of Biola, will not be compromised by the challenges of this world. We are rising above this to make a great Biola education even better. And through it all, through this historic moment, I believe you will see the sovereignty of God at work at Biola, 
so that you students listening tonight and all the ones that aren't listening, right, are able to rise up through this setback to learn more collaboratively and live more courageously and lead more confidently and love more contagiously. This is what we want, we want to see in you. We are so ready for you to start the year with us. And now our provost and senior vice president, Dr. Deborah Taylor will share how the faculty are preparing for remote instruction and the new things that are underway with them. And she's gonna be followed by our vice president for student development, Dr. Andre Stevens, and then Dr. Kerry Stockton and Sarah Templeton. And after that, we're gonna answer the questions that you've submitted. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Dr. Taylor, you're live. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Corey, and good evening, Biola students and parents. As you just heard from President Corey, we're all still feeling the disappointment that many of you are about not being able to welcome you to our campus in person on August 31st, the first day of our fall 2020 semester. However, our academic deans and faculty have been preparing for this possibility all summer. And so I'm highly confident in the immense amount of work that's been done by our faculty to create a dynamic academic experience, as well as a deep sense of spiritual connection and community for you this fall. So we're looking forward to some of the enhanced ways that faculty will be able to interact with you remotely until that time in which our campus will reopen for in-person instruction. So I'm gonna do my best in this few minutes that I have to clarify some of the things that I'm sure are on your minds as you anticipate the fall semester. So first of all, the semester will begin on August 31st and conclude on December 11th. And I know that one of your primary concerns is the quality of your class experience. And I just wanna assure you, we have all been working feverishly so that you will have the best academic experience we can possibly deliver. We've had phenomenal teams across this campus working all summer, some of them from their homes, but some of us on campus as well, to equip our classrooms with new technology, to provide additional support to our faculty to navigate the new technologies, and our classrooms now enable both filming and recording of course content. So unlike the spring semester, faculty will now be able to come to the campus and most will be teaching from these newly equipped classrooms unless they have a campus or home office that has been professionally equipped to the high standards that we've now established. And we've been partnering with our competent digital learning team and they have really rapidly expanded their services and resources and provided direct consultation to our faculty on how to enhance their video presentations. We've purchased new technology for our faculty to utilize this fall, including Zoom licenses, which is a significant enhancement for faculty because they can utilize it to do breakout groups and to facilitate a wider variety of learning activities. And it also permits our faculty to capture their lectures, learning activities, or even discussion groups for later viewing, although our classes will be following their existing schedules. We know this will be a great benefit to our international students and those who reside in other time zones. And we're just excited about some of the other new technology that we've acquired that will allow our faculty to self-record and publish ADA compliant videos and incorporate new templates that will enhance the aesthetics of their courses for our students. Now we know the students that you already have your course schedules for the fall semester, and we want to adhere to those schedules to the very extent possible. So we are expecting nearly all courses will be taught synchronously. In other words, at the day and time for which you originally registered. However, we also know some of you have new responsibilities to manage due to COVID, which is why we've adopted this high flex model this fall. That means our classes can be recorded or content can be delivered to those who need an accommodation. So if you're already registered for a course that's been designed for pure online delivery, you can expect that course will be delivered asynchronously. In other words, not at a specific time, and that gives greater flexibility to across the time zones. Or if you're enrolled in a post-traditional adult program or one of our graduate programs that were designed to be fully online, those have a slightly different tuition structure, and those of you that are in that programs are probably familiar with that. But our traditional full-time undergraduates, if they decide to take just one online course, that just fits right into your regular 18 full-time credit hour fees that is covered by your full-time tuition. 
Um, I was in a conversation this week with one of our faculty and she reminded me, you know, many of these tools and strategies the students will be engaging with this fall in remote courses will actually equip them for the new expectations that are increasingly demanded by employers and industries. So our faculty are actually conscious of this is they're going to coach you through how to do a remote presentation and how to do group work in an online virtual environment. So we'll, we just want to reassure you, your classes are being designed with the highest level of academic engagement so that you achieve the exact same learning outcomes as you would have if you'd been here in person. We would have canceled these classes if we didn't believe we could deliver them effectively in a remote fashion. So over the summer, we've had faculty groups from every academic discipline who have worked together and they have had multiple plans as we anticipated the fall semester since we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. And so now we've engaged in our reevaluation processes and determined which is the best way to deliver the plans that we have worked on. And we will just continue to refine our efforts. And we've discovered there really are opportunities for greater creativity in utilizing some of the new software that our faculty have developed. And some of them have actually learned some new teaching strategies this summer from disciplinary experts in other universities who already had developed creative ways to teach academic content online. So if there is a chance that any of the delivery modes for your classes is changing, you will certainly be notified of such. But as of today, there are very few cases where a quality remote delivery option has not been imagined and developed. Of course, our science labs, art classes, performance classes have been among the most challenging to develop, but I am amazed and proud of how our faculty have risen to the challenges. And I will get to share a couple examples with you a little later in this call. So now I'd like you to hear from our Vice President of Student Development, Dr. Andre Stevens, and you'll hear a little more how his team has been preparing to foster greater community in our remote environment. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, and good evening, Viola friends. Uh, growing in community while remaining physically distant can certainly be challenging, uh, but not impossible. This is why the team in student development is dedicated to making the online student experience rich and fulfilling. Our virtual format will continue to provide opportunities for students to access our student services and educational programs. Our vision in student development remains to see every student empowered, transformed, and thriving. Our team will continue to ensure that all students can access and utilize the first-class student resources that Biola has to offer. Let me just share a couple of those things um, in the few minutes that I have. You can certainly expect students to have meaningful remote and online connection through areas like pastoral care and chapel programming, Chapels will continue to be an important part of our weekly rhythms and spiritual nourishment as we seek to foster your spiritual development. You'll have an opportunity to attend at least three chapels each week with a requirement of fulfilling 14 for the semester. Additionally, our pastoral care team led by Dean of Spiritual Development and campus pastor, Dr. Todd Pickett, are ready to connect with you via phone or Zoom as needed. For our new students, you should be accessing the online orientation, orientation modules on the website. On August 29th, we will have several streamed welcome events that you will hear from key leaders, uh, campus leaders, including Dr. Corey. Even through Zoom, we are making every effort to connect with you, student leaders, staff and faculty who will welcome you, encourage you, and help you to navigate through this semester. A few things to support you during the semester, our, our learning center will continue to be available for tutoring support and disability services. Our, our um, student development will continue to par partner with our SEED um, office in developing community building initiatives that deepen and deepening existing ones. In this season, we are enhancing and creating varied weekly small group gatherings for new and returning students to join and to build community with each other. Groups will be led by trained student leaders on a wide variety of topics, from hobbies to shared interests, groups for just new students, and groups for graduating seniors in this particular season that we're in. 
we'll have groups for spiritual connection, first gen groups, groups for those who from uh, diverse cultural backgrounds. In addition, we're planning some fun activities, game competitions, fitness and trivia challenges and other fun events just to bring the entire student community together. There will be something for everyone. Earlier this week, um, I just wanna share a little bit of what we heard from uh, NCAA for our athletes who are on the line. The Board of Governors made a decision to allow each division within the NCAA to determine whether to hold national championships for our fall sports programs. As you may have heard, um, Division II President's Councils announced that fall sports championships will be canceled this year. This was certainly difficult news for us to hear. Our athletic director, Dr. Bethany Miller, is already involved in preliminary discussions at the PAC West conference level about having seasons this spring that meet NCAA season of competition waiver criteria. As we know more specifically, we will certainly share that with you. And again, our winter and spring sports will have a decision on October 1st regarding how we are proceeding with their seasons of competition. As, as we move to remote learning to begin the fall semester, our athletics teams, um, it's, it's been hard not to be together and working out, but we did receive approval um, to have uh, voluntary off-campus workouts. So we will be in touch with you through your coaches, if not already, about those policies and procedures. All that to say, we are excited, even in this COVID season, to continue to um, connect with you um, and build Biola community even stronger, um, even though we might be separated um, through the screens. Let me now turn it over to my dear friend and colleague, the Associate Vice President for Student Success and Academic Engagement, Dr. Carrie Stockton. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Um, I am so grateful for each student and family member on the call tonight. And I know that you, like us, are navigating so many decisions where there seem to be new information every day. Um, and as you've already heard us say on this call, we at Biola, we are with you and we're preparing for you to study with us in the fall with great anticipation. In my role as Associate Vice President, I spend a lot of my time leading and planning to ensure that students are thriving academically and vocationally during their time at Biola. It's our deep commitment to see your studies come to life and to give you a path forward into your calling and vocation during and after Biola. Our continued students, our continuing students on the call, they know that there are so many individuals who are part of the advising and coaching experience along that process faculty advisors in your major, staff advisors in your department or in the advising center, career specialists at the career center, and so many other campus partners who mentor and invest in your journeys. If the disruptions of this summer have created stress or questions for you as you prepare for the fall, particularly as they relate to your fall semester schedule, I'd encourage you to reach out to us. For incoming students, your first point of contact is the advising center. You can email academic.advising at biola.edu for any help that you might need, or you can call us, of course. For our continuing students, we would love if you would reach out first to your academic program. And then if you still need help, feel free to call us and contact us in the Advising Center. We're here to help. We heard a few students say that they weren't sure if we were taking appointments. Um, if you're used to using Handshake, we don't use Handshake for appointments in the summer. So email us and we'll make sure you get the support you need. Our teams at Biola, as you've heard, are pivoting quickly and making great plans to support you in a variety of ways, some of which we'll be able to tell you about very soon and some of which I wanna tell you about right now. Um, I'm excited, I'm so excited about the collaborative work that's happening across campus through our Biola Shares initiatives to identify and support students in the basic needs that may arise, particularly in this ever-shifting season. Partnerships with so many areas on campus, including student development, our IT area, the library, advancement, campus safety, student enrichment and intercultural engagement, SEED, you've heard them referred to, are making it possible to develop new and tangible ways to provide our students with basic needs support. Some of these resources include a list of all textbooks that are being held as library eBooks for this fall. I think we have about 
340 required texts that have been bought and collected for the fall. And we're transitioning our normal, our, our weekly pop-up food pantry that you're familiar with that we usually hold in our student union building to a weekly drive-through pop-up food pantry on campus for local students. We're working on some other initiatives to provide internet and technological needs for you to support your Biola at home experience. If you'd like to know more and be in the loop on these initiatives, please be sure to fill out our fall student basic needs assessment form that you can now find on our Biola at home webpage. The Career Center also has some great opportunities planned for the fall. We're offering several virtual career expos the week of September 22nd that have different industry emphases. Virtual appointments are currently available and will continue to be available with our career specialists and peer internship ambassadors. You can find those in Handshake. Other events and online resources will be available to explore, experience, and connect as well. I know for incoming students and families, this is going to be a different transition and start to Viola than you might have expected. Our teams are making plans to ensure that all incoming students have an extra measure of personalized support and mentoring. And we'll have more specific information about our approach as soon as possible. We're praying for you. We're so grateful that you're choosing Biola either again or for the first time. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the amazing Sarah Templeton, Director of our Health Center. Good evening. We are so thankful that you tuned in tonight. Um, thanks again for being here. Our desire at the Health Center is to keep you well informed and really to reiterate our commitment to serving you both in this season of remote learning and when we return to campus. As we, as we have shared previously, some of the keys to opening a safe campus include the ability to test, trace, quarantine, and isolate. For months now, we have been working to ensure these mechanisms are in place. We are actively building our test capacity, which includes the use of in-house COVID-19 testing, as well as in partnership with off-campus labs. Additionally, we have internal um, teams of healthcare professionals who have been trained in contact tracing practices and will work with local health departments should we have cases on campus. We have a process in place to identify potential close contacts and can offer evaluation, testing, and further guidance at the health center from one of our physicians or nurse practitioners. For those students uh, living on campus when we return, we have quarantine and isolation rooms set aside to accommodate those needs. And we are absolutely committed to working with campus partners to provide meal delivery, spiritual and mental health care as needed, and ongoing medical assessments. All others will be asked to self-isolate at home. Regarding a safe return, we recognize it will take a collective effort from each one of us on campus to keep our campus open. Until we have a vaccine and or an effective treatment, it will be crucial for us to comply with the following measures. Stay home when sick. Uh, you heard it first here. You can stay home when you're sick. Physical distancing, hand washing, use of cloth face coverings while out and about on campus and sanitization. We recognize that while many of our students are young and super healthy, there are many on our campus who aren't and could be uh, severely affected by COVID-19. Our beloved professors, some of them, and advisors and staff members, um, as well as people in our community. So this is a season for us to kind of join together and have a new opportunity to love one another by working together on these measures. Thank you again for joining us this evening. We are now going to transition to answering your questions and Dr. Corey will lead this Q&A time. Great, um, thanks Sarah for that handoff. And um, I'm just gonna make a, a preface before we uh, answer the questions. And that is that um, we know a lot, but we don't know everything. So what we're sharing with you in answer to your questions is of information that we have today based on the current circumstances, right? So we don't have all the answers, but we're gonna to attempt to answer your questions as just we can. It seems like uh, for all of us, um, each week seems to bring about some something new and we continue to plan for what might happen next and that said just want you to know that things change um we're certainly much clearer of what's going to happen than we were a week ago but we just want to give you as much information as we can but uh just ask that you be patient and flexible and understanding that uh rapidly changing events may require us to do th different things that maybe what's then what's communicated uh today 
We hope that's not the case, but it could be. Um, again, a lot of questions came in, uh, 275 or so. We tried to bundle the topics to cover as much as possible, but if we don't get to your questions, if you and you have a burning question, email us, please. Internal.communications at biola.edu. That is internal.communications at biola.edu. And we will respond to your questions. We promise you that we will. Uh, Brenda Velasco is our Senior Director of University Communications. She's going to ask, uh, ask the question and call on one of us to respond. So Brenda, uh, you're up. Great. Thank you, Dr. Corey. And good evening, uh, students and families. And thank you for joining us on this call. I see a lot of states represented. Uh, so thank you for everyone that's on the call. Um, the first question is for Lee Wilhite. Uh, when will the $2,000 grant for undergrads be applied to my account? Thank you, Brenda. And good evening, everybody. It's great to be with you tonight. I have the opportunity of serving as Viola's Vice President for Enrollment Marketing and Communications. We've been working hard for your arrival this fall. And yes, we just awarded out this last week $2,000 grants for you. And I'm encouraged to say that uh, at the end of last week, just over about a three day period of time, our financial aid team did in fact apply that grant to your bill, your student bills. And so you'll see that now reflected uh, on your bill. We also earlier this week applied any room and board credit uh, to your bills. And so you can go online and see that as well. The only exception to that would be our nursing students. Uh, those that, um, uh, have received a, uh, 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 a bit of an exemption from an educational standpoint because they work in the healthcare industry to be able to take classes online. If those nursing students are coming to campus, they will in fact have those room and board um, fees applied to their bill when they're uh, assigned in housing. But for the majority of you, uh, your room and board credit, your tuition grant has been applied. You can see that on my account. Uh, and if you have any questions or if there's still charges on there that look um, suspicious to you, you don't understand them or you want some further uh, clarification, go ahead and email undergrad.housing at biola.edu. That's undergrad.housing at biola.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, this next question is uh, for our Chief of Campus Safety, uh, John Ojukaskova. And so the question is, why can UCLA and USC and Concordia athletes return to campus, but Biola athletes cannot? Uh, thank, thank you for that question, Brenda. And uh, good evening in the Biola community. We, uh, we have been following uh, developments on this uh, specific subject, and so is the County of Los Angeles. Uh, during a recent teleconference call, with county officials, they warned us uh, not to repopulate you know, campuses with athletes or other students groups without any authorization uh, whatsoever from them. In relation you know, to our campus, uh, we would like to bring athletes and other students groups you know, back on campus, like you just heard from President Corey, in some capacity, but we do not want to we want to make sure that we are authorized not to do so. We don't think that to be fair on you, a student, an athlete, if we make a decision to repopulate without any authorization from the county and then be penalized or forced to vacate a campus. We want you to be assured that once we receive approval to repopulate our campus, we will make sure that we assess and determine how and when to welcome you as students back on campus. Back to you, Brenda. Thank you, Chief John. And I, I just wanna clarify something um, that Lee may have said about our nursing students. That our nursing students will, clinical nursing students will be uh, having on-campus in-person classes and will not be doing classes remotely so there are two groups of students. One is the clinical nursing and the doctoral psychology uh, program students that will be on campus uh, because they have an exemption from the county. So this next question oh, is for Chief John again. So if a student is in LA, will they have any opportunities to meet with other local students or professors? Yeah, so this is another aspect that we, we do recognize that it is very, very uh, important, you know, both students and uh, faculty, you know, members. 
However, for the overall you know, safety and health of students and faculty, the County of Los Angeles strongly recommends at this point that we stick to a virtual meeting only. Thank you, Chief John. Uh, this question is for Andre Stevens. How will special services be provided for students with learning disabilities? Thank you, Brenda. Thank you for that question. And so academic accommodations for students with any type of psychological, medical, learning, or physical diagnoses will still be widely available through the Learning Center remotely. Students seeking accommodations are encouraged to contact the Learning Center by emailing learning.center at biola.edu. The first step in this especially for new students will be to provide up-to-date documentation from the appropriately licensed healthcare professional. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andre. And there was some technical difficulties at the end, I believe. And so he said that the first step in the process is to provide up-to-date documentation. So uh, this next question is for Carrie Stockton. Does Biola have any recommendations on what type of computer or electronics incoming freshmen should have? Thanks, Brenda. So I consulted with our IT and digital learning offices for this question for expertise, and they gave me some great advice to pass along. If you have a computer already and both Zoom and your web browser are working well, then it should work well for your studies for this coming year. Um, if you need a new computer, they would encourage you to consider a mid-tier Mac or PC laptop. They'd discourage um, getting a Chromebook um, and they give a, a range, but I think you can consult with them for more guidance. Um, they've also found that uh, low end or budget computers sometimes won't last you your entire time at Biola. So for our incoming students, you might wanna consider investing here um, and consider an accidental warranty, they said. And they'd also recommend that you check with your major department to see if there are any additional technical requirements for your personal computer. You can imagine that our cinema area, our graphic design, um, or computer science might have some particular recommendations. But feel free to contact our IT department for further guidance and support they are happy to help. Thank you, Carrie. Um, this next question is for Andre Stevens. Um, it's, the question is, can students still apply for jobs at Biola? And then we're also getting questions in the chat, uh, additionally asking, what about students out of state? Hey, thank you, Brenda. And I hope I don't freeze up or sound like a robot this time. I apologize, technical difficulties here. Uh, but yes, there are still student jobs uh, on, on a virtual uh, campus to be hired this fall. And those positions obviously would be done remotely. Uh, the student jobs are posted on our Handshake site, viola.joinhandshake.com. We are currently working on a way for out-of-state students to be able to work for, for Biola remotely. Um, so that is not set yet, but we will uh, know more in the coming weeks if that's possible. And we will certainly let students know uh, when we know if that's possible. But thank you for that question. Thank you, Andre. Um, this question is for Lee. Is there still a plan to hold a formal in-person graduation ceremony for spring 2020 grads at any point in the future? Will the December 2020 graduates still have their graduation ceremony? Thank you, Brenda. And the answer is yes, we are still committed to holding an on ground in person ceremony, not only for our spring 2020 graduates, but also those that will be graduating December of 2020 as well. Of course, this is dependent on state and county health guidelines in terms of the timing of it. Uh, we are considering timeframes such as mid fall semester, maybe at the earliest end of fall semester, uh, early spring semester. Those are three time slots that we're considering uh, for those ceremonies. Uh, we will definitely let you know as soon as we hear from the state and county, as soon as we can solidify those dates, as soon as we can finalize those plans, we will get the word out to you, to our graduates, upcoming graduates, to your family, so you can plan accordingly. Thank you, Lee. Um, this question's for Andre Stevens. If students rent an apartment for the year and Biola opens campus at some point, will students under the age of 20 still be required to live on campus 
uh, for instance, if they have had to sign a, a one-year lease for their apartment? Yes, thank you. Uh, fair question. Uh, yes, so we are granting a one-time exception for students who are under age 20 and they sign a lease locally here. So, um, so they wouldn't have to return to campus and break that lease in the middle of the, in the, middle of the year. So thank you. Thank you, Andre. And a follow-up question is, I'm curious how housing will handle the return to school mid-semester if the campus opens up, particularly if assigned roommates do not return for on-campus living? Yes, another uh, great question. So in the event that we are able to return to campus, um, every student who's interested in and able to return to campus will reapply for housing. Uh, while we will do our best to honor the original roommate matches, uh, but as you know, if the roommate doesn't return to campus, we will find an appropriate match for them. Students will also have the option to communicate a new roommate request if their original roommate is not returning to campus. And so while we will do our best to prioritize original room placement, this may not be possible, again, due to some students returning and other students choosing to stay remote. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. This question is for Lee Well, hi. If my daughter chooses to wait to attend Biola until fall 2021, can she defer her admittance and uh, financial aid package? Uh, and similarly, another question, if a student does not return in the fall, will they be able to continue in the spring or next year with their previous academic scholarship um, when they, the school opens in person or will they have to start over and apply again? Yeah, thank you, Brenda, great question. Uh, the answer is this, if any student wants to take a gap year as a result of uh, being remote this fall, we will honor their academic scholarship and we will preserve their semester-based financial aid packages uh, for their return to Biola when they can uh, rejoin us. We're gonna do that in accordance with our normal state, federal, institutional financial aid policies, uh, including but not limited to the calculation of need-based aid. So the, the answer is yes, uh, those will be considered uh, and be applied when the students return back to campus. Great, thank you for that. Um, Andre, this next question is for you. If a student was selected to be an RA and they wait to return in the spring, if when the school opens in person, when will they be able to start in their positions at that time? Yeah, thank you. Great question again. And RAs, as you know, are a critical piece of our uh, peer uh, leadership program at Biola. And so to answer the question simply, yes, if a student is unable to or maybe not interested in serving as a remote RA during the fall semester, we will certainly hold their place for the spring semester. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, this question is for Carrie Stockton. If my daughter doesn't attend the fall semester, does she lose her uh, scholarship, which Lee kind of answered already, but she has two classes in the fall that are prerequisites to spring classes. If she doesn't take those two classes in the fall and takes a semester at a junior college, does that set her back an entire year? Great, great questions. Um, yes, Lee did address the question of academic scholarships um, we've made a commitment that for any student who wants to take a gap semester or year as a result of being remote in the fall, we'll honor their academic scholarship. Um, I want to say, though, that in regard to other scholarships, academic program scholarships, et cetera, students will want to consult either with their admissions counselor or their program advisor if they're a continuing student to receive the most accurate information possible about holding a spot, um, holding a scholarship in a given program. And just for guidance, continuing students who want a gap semester, um, you will need to officially withdraw from the university and complete the fairly straightforward readmission process. Incoming students will also wanna let their admissions counselor know if they plan to enroll in a later semester. For the second question related to prerequisites, um, I really wish that I could give a specific answer, but the answer truly is it depends. So some classes are offered only once a year. If the prerequisite sequence is a fall spring offering, it can, can create some complexities for you. Um, sometimes prerequisites can be waived, but not always because sometimes that knowledge is essential to your success in the next course. 
I know that we're gonna do everything we can to support you in your graduation timeline. So students should consult with their academic program or the advising center to determine the implications of getting off sequence with prerequisite requirements. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, this question is uh, for Deborah Taylor. My daughter is a junior CMA film major. How will remote learning be effective for hands-on learning, equipment, usage of equipment, sets, costumes, et cetera? Will CMA majors be able to check out film equipment? And another question that came in is, I'm a film student wondering how classes like sound engineering and cinematography and edit editing will be executed efficiently online. All right, thank you, Brenda. Those are nice, hard questions, and we've been working to figure them out. So um, first of all, I want you to know we do have a new dean of CMA, Dr. Tom Helene, who joined us in May, and he has been just diligently, proactively connecting with faculty and students to try to find solutions to these very questions. So he's been very busy since he's joined us. How would you like that to be your first semester as a dean in a college you have to join all this right now? But he's been doing a great job. And we're excited to tell you that we've recently been informed that it is highly likely that we can actually allow curbside pickup of our equipment. And so we've been putting all the plans in place to do that so that students can drive to campus, pick up our equipment, take it, make their films. And so all of the professors have put together plans for how you can continue with your program. And so, but I would say if you have really specific questions about engineering, CMA, about a really um, class that you're concerned about, just reach out to that department because the faculty who teach it have been preparing for all these logistics. And if you have a little extra time and you'd like to watch a really inspiring video, our new CMA Dean is on Viola Instagram telling his vision for the school and some of the things that he's already putting into place. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Carrie Stockton. Um, so a concern of mine is PE credits. Will these be removed as a requirement to graduate or will they be available online as well? What's going to happen with regards to students who need to take their single unit physical ed class uh, such as the uh, kinesiology 110 class? Great question. I had the same question when we decided to go remote. So the kinesiology and health sciences department, so impressed with them. They are creating PE activity classes that can be done at home. Examples of which include walk, jog, body weight training, stretch and strength. Um, some of their courses did have to be canceled and the students in those courses should receive follow-up information, but they let me know today that they do still have seats in available activity courses. Our advising staff will be reaching out to seniors who were in classes that might have been canceled to provide guidance so that we can do everything possible to ensure that you have what you need to meet your graduation requirements on time. Great, <clears throat> thank you. This one's for um, Dr. Taylor. Will there be any breaks from online school during the year starting at a staring at a screen in a house with bad Wi-Fi and a loud family will take a toll on students mentally? Thank you, Brenda. Yeah, that sounds like it could take a toll on anybody. And I think some of us have been experiencing that in our summers as well. So as I mentioned earlier, our faculty have been undergoing training this summer and throughout some of the spring as well. And how do they adapt their teaching and pedagogy to the remote learning environment? And so as they look at the length of their class session, students will be given the appropriate short breaks, They'll have opportunities to maybe move away from the screen and reflect a little on what they were just um, talked or what was presented to them and to then maybe be broken into discussion groups with their fellow classmates. So I can promise you all of our faculty have also experienced the toll that Zoom can take on us and those screen meetings. And so we all have really uh, committed to have sensitivity to our students and utilize as flexible of teaching strategies as we can throughout the semester. So I think you can count on that being something that will be first and foremost in everyone's minds. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. And there's another Zoom question. So does remote learning mean classes over Zoom calls or will the professors be posting lectures on Canvas? Yeah, thank you. Um, so as you can imagine, this is a hard question to answer because we have over 350 classes being offered this fall. And so it's gonna depend a little on the discipline, the course, the professor, 
And so remote learning will actually take a lot of different forms. Now, I do think most of our professors will utilize Zoom because of some of the capacity that it gives us, but there will be other kinds of learning activities and teaching approaches that the faculty will be utilizing. So some of them may post some lecture slides on Canvas and say, students review this prior to our class discussion so that when we're together on Zoom, we can actually be engaging with one another. Or they may post it on Canvas so that you could review your class content before an exam. But every faculty member will be submitting their fall teaching plans to their academic dean <clears throat> and then we've also instituted a mechanism where we'll be collecting feedback from students throughout the semester on how effective is this class in helping you to learn. And that way we can make any pivots or adjustments if we need to. Thank you for that. Um, and the next question for you, Dr. Taylor, and actually we're getting a similar questions about this very topic in the live chat. So uh, there are some people that are wondering this as well. So how are you planning on supporting fine arts students who rely on school resources and in-person teaching uh, and ensembles for music? All right, thank you. So I thought when I first read this that I got the stumper question of the night, but I know Carrie got the one on PE. So I think we both got the hard ones, but I actually got to reach out to some of our music and art faculty in order to answer this question. And I have some very exciting answers for you. So thank you whoever asked this because it got me excited about the creativity that they are doing. So let me talk first about art. So I've been informed by our art faculty that they will actually be doing demonstrations of the drawing processes. They'll be pre-recording them and then giving the students an opportunity to view them multiple times as they draw along. And then they'll also be performed live to clarify and amplify the concepts. And then they're also outfitting the art studios with specialized AV equipment so that that can help support the complex visual content that the faculty want to convey to students. And then every week, the art classes will move through a set of drawing assignments at home. This is a drawing class, obviously. And they'll follow the demonstration utilizing synchronous class times to get some of their work done. And then the professor will give them actual feedback and in progress correction of their assignments. And then they're also gonna be holding individual and group virtual meetings so that every student will get individualized feedback on the work that they're doing, which is pretty remarkable. So I'm very impressed by that. So that's one example from art. And then in music, I was able to connect with Dr. Shauna Stewart, our choral ensembles professor. And this is what she's doing. She actually gave me the schedule for her classes. On Mondays, she's gonna lead warm-ups and online sight reading exercises, teach diction and facilitate discussions on the text, have music sing-throughs with the accompanists, and then other non-conducting activities. And then they will spend about 20 minutes in devotion and break into breakout rooms for discussion and praying for one another. Then on Wednesdays, they're gonna structure the class around relationship building activities. And that's when some of the individual Zooms will happen between the section leaders and the conductor. And then on Fridays, the sections will meet with their section leader and each singer will actually sing individually for their section and receive critique. So she's got a really well-developed plan of how she's going to be interacting with, providing the right kind of feedback to students. And then she said that by the third week of September, they'll actually begin recording for the virtually produced fall concert. And then in early October, the recording will begin for the virtually produced Christmas concert. So those were just a couple of the examples I was able to gather, but I hope it just gives you a sense of the amount of work and preparation creativity and individuality each faculty has invested when they look at their course, their students, and how they can make this remote learning experience professional, educationally strong, and really meaningful to the students. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, this question's for Carrie Stockton. If I struggle with online learning, in what ways can Biola professors further assist me? Will tutors through the Learning Center still be available? Yeah, I know that the transition to online learning can be a challenge. Um, our faculty, as you've heard, you've heard Dr. Taylor already describe some amazing examples of their commitment to your success. I've heard a lot of stories over the years of faculty providing support outside of the classroom for students. Um, our faculty host office hours outside of class time each week, and we'll deliver those appointments virtually in the fall. And yes, our learning center is committed to providing quality tutoring and academic mentoring, 
We also have peer consultants at our writing center, our rhetoric and writing center, who are ready to provide feedback virtually for your writing projects at any stage in a friendly and supportive environment. Our math lab is also ready to serve this fall. And some classes have additional tutoring opportunities as well that are built in. I'm just gonna give you a quick tip too from my perspective. Consider reaching out to find peers in your classes who might be interested in a study group um, or, or chat, because I think that in-class peer support is so helpful in the learning experience. Thank you so much, Dr. Stockton. Um, <clears throat> this one is for Dr. Taylor. Uh, will you require professors to provide the same amount of instructional time as if the class was in person? For example, a three-hour lecture class will be three hours live. Thanks, Brenda. So I think as I addressed a few minutes ago, if it was a three hour class, it would probably be broken up into different kinds of learning activities. I don't think there would be very many faculty who would wanna stare at the Zoom screen and just talk at a student for three hours. So hopefully that won't be your experience. But um, I just, just wanna use this opportunity to um, clarify that under our regional accreditation requirements, we, we are given guidelines of what constitutes an academic credit. And so the way that works is if it's a three credit hour course, that means three hours a week of class time with an instructor and then six hours outside of class time that the student can work on the assignments related to the course. So in a, like, if we took a three unit course as an example, as was mentioned in this, there would be the scheduled three weekly hours with the professor and that'll take a variety of formats, right? I mentioned the different ways that faculty could do that, but it'll also include this time that students spend working outside of class. So some of our faculty will want to provide some of that content to you in written or recorded form, maybe in advance of a class session, but then that would count as part of your six hours that you spend outside of class. So that that means the three hours they spend with you might be more discussion based, more learning activity based. But I think you can count on the fact that there will be very few classes where it will just be a straight on lecture for a three hour period of time. Great, thank you, Dr. Taylor. <clears throat> We got a, a couple of questions in the chat and I just, uh, it's something that keeps recurring. So I'm gonna ask Andre Stevens to answer this question. Who are the people that are allowed to be given special circumstances to live on campus or in Biola housing? Thank you, thank you, Brenda. So currently, and I think you heard from Dr. Corey and from Chief John that we're not allowed to repopulate the campus. The only exceptions currently are uh, those students who remain with us from the spring from the spring when we vacated campus and there are about 27 students and then the clinical nursing students. And I think Lee and Brenda, you've talked about that. Now our hope and our desire is that when the state guidelines come out and the county allows us that we can expand that group to include those with special circumstances. And of course we have to wait for those guidelines to, to determine who would fall into that category. We'd love to have, um, obviously we mentioned athletes before, international students who are in the US and need a place to stay. And then again, those who uh, have special circumstances like some ho housing insecurity, uh, for example, but we don't know that yet. And so um, as soon as the state releases the guidelines and the county uh, guidelines, we have those directives, um, we will align with that. And, and again, invite those who are eligible uh, to move on to campus. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Carrie Stockton. As the public libraries are still closed, uh, thus no computer access, will students without access to a computer be allowed to borrow a Biola laptop for the remote fall semester? And will the Biola bookstore be open for the semester even though we are uh, having remote learning? And what about other campus resources? Will they be open? Yes, IT will have laptops available to loan for the fall semester. Um, and you can find further information about that process and how to borrow a computer on the IT website. Um, regarding bookstore and library information, while Biola is providing remote instruction, students who live in the local community will most likely be able to access campus for curbside pickup of books and supplies from the bookstore and the library. We're still waiting to get more information and more specifics from the county on other access to campus. We'll have more information, we believe, by August 10th, 
The Biola store will also be shipping book orders to students. And if county and state guidelines allow the store to open, Biola will consider doing so during the semester. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Corey, this question is for you. How can parents offer support and encouragement to Biola faculty and staff? How can parents and alumni help students connect locally and create and maintain community? Yeah, great question. Thanks for such an encouraging um, uh, question like that. So first of all, pray for us, right? We need it um, and we receive it and are grateful for it. Um, you know, to encourage faculty and staff, you know, just be direct and letting them know something specific that they did uh, for you as a parent or for you as a student. And I'm finding that the like, simple acts of gratitude or kindness are really amplified uh, during stressful times like this. So, you know, I think that's, that goes a long way, uh, a word of affirmation, a word of encouragement. So, you know, do that whenever you can. It goes a long way. And about, you know, about connecting locally, uh, maybe as a parent or an alumnus, you want to see if there are students in your geographic area that you can get together. And so, you know, go to a local park, honor the health protocols and, um, and get together and just like be and hear the stories. And, and I think that'd be a great thing to do. And um, there are plenty of ways in which we can help you facilitate who might be in your area as well. So again, the best way to encourage um, us uh, is to, uh, in each other is to remind us, we're going to get through this. Um, we're going to keep emphasizing just kind of common sense safety measures that we need to follow. And, and we are continuing to, you know, to work and to pray. Ora elabora. Thank you, Dr. Corey. Uh, this question's for Andre Stevens. What is your plan to allow transfer students to meet students, other students and make friends? Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, I know some of our transfer students are new transfer students, uh, maybe, but not always uh, similar to our uh, undergraduate freshmen coming right out of high school. Still very, very important for us to connect and uh, make friends. And so I mentioned earlier our orientation process that includes our transfer students, as well as a number of different, um, again, virtual communities that student development is developing uh, for the fall. And we will launch that in the next few weeks. You will get information about different groups uh, that you can join and connect, again, whether it's interests or hobbies. Um, we are going to make this virtual community very special um, for our transfer students. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Sarah Templeton. If students are living off campus in communal housing and they get sick, what should they do? Is the campus health center going to be open and assessing uh, sick students? And could there be uh, some guidelines regarding students moving into homes together or to start online classes? For example, should they all get a negative COVID test before moving in? Any protocols for if a student should come down with COVID? Yeah, thank you for that uh, bundle of questions there, Brenda. Those are great questions. And yes, the Student Health Center will be open to local students for both telehealth and some in-person appointments. If a local student feels concerned about COVID-19 exposure or symptoms, we would ask them to connect with the health center or follow up with their primary care provider if they're local as well uh, for further evaluation and isolation instructions while we're remote. When we return, we will need all students to report these uh, COVID related concerns to the health center. Um, local students who desire an appointment with one of our providers for a COVID related concern or any other healthcare issue uh, should give our health center a call for an appointment. And for those off-campus guidelines, we'd sure be happy to share those with you. If that's something that's of interest to you, please email us at health.center at biola.edu. And you can just put off-campus guidelines uh, in the memo there and attention to me and we'll get right back to you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, this question is for Andre Stevens. I appreciate that the team has put different procedures and policies in place to ensure uh, students are safe. Are you also putting into place consequences for those who refuse to cooperate? What will the consequences be for students who refuse to cooperate with the protocols? Uh, thank you, Brenda. I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, but if it does, <laughs> um, you know, we, we are asking our, our students to, to really act responsibly um, as a member of, of uh, this community. And so um, when we're allowed to return, uh, there certainly will be guidelines as, as was mentioned in the question and community standards that we expect our students to adhere to. 
uh, because the health and safety of our community is so important during this time, and our desire is to mitigate the risk of an outbreak on campus, we will have strict um, enforcement of our policies. And so if a student is um, just accidentally forgets um, his or her mask, um, we uh, have, we will provide masks actually for students who will be on campus. And so, um, you know, we'll, we will uh, give a mask to them. But if a student, I think in the question, it implies that a student is rebellious or refuses to cooperate. Um, in that scenario, we would um, issue a warning uh, maybe once um, or twice. Um, the student will be placed on probation. And then if a, if a third violation occurs, um, that behavior could uh, potentially cause a student to lose their ability to be on campus or even continue as a student at Biola. So we are going to take it seriously. And I think your question is a, is a very good one. And again, this is um, for the good of the community. And so I, I, again, I said, I hope that we don't have to go there, but if we do, um, there will be strict enforcement. So thank you. Thank you. Um, this question is for, for Sarah. I was wondering if someone in the nursing program contracts COVID-19, what will happen? I know many things are uncertain now, but I was wondering if there's an action plan, if that does take place as it is possible. Yeah, so the nursing department is actually working on this very issue right now as far as understanding those requirements at the various clinical sites. Um, please reach out to your clinical instructor as they will be able to kind of guide you on the specifics related to your site. Uh, the university has also prepared safety protocols that need to be uh, verified and, and sort of vetted by the clinical site before the student begins their work at that location. Uh, nursing students, like all local students, will have access to the health center this fall. Uh, we would ask nursing students to immediately report a potential COVID-19 exposure and or symptoms to the health center by phone. If this occurs after hours, you will be connected to one of us, one of the healthcare providers, by calling the Campus Safety Emergency Line. And we will be able to offer you testing, evaluation, treatment, contact tracing, quarantine and isolation instructions, and ongoing assessments to nursing and all other local students should there be a COVID case on campus. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for Lee. Will international students be able to maintain their F1 visas as they continue to study in Biola remotely while they're in their home country? Thank you, Brenda. And the answer is yes. Uh, continuing international students holding an F1 visa uh, will continue, can continue studying at Biola remotely this fall while they're in their home countries. That's the good news. Uh, you will, they will be able to maintain their F1 visa status as long as they enroll as full-time students. Uh, so that's something to take note of. If you are an incoming new international student, you can uh, enroll uh, at Biola remotely from any place in the world uh, this fall. So we welcome all of our international students this fall. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Dr. Taylor, a question about uh, for the international students who will be staying at their home country, how will the education look like for them? Will they be given leeway or time due to the time zone difference? Yes, absolutely. We would do that. We want that to, we want you guys to know that's an issue that we care deeply about. We don't want you taking your classes at 2 a.m. So our professors will work individually with you. If you're an international student, they'll help you understand the expectations of the course, and then they'll make whatever accommodations they need to make in order for you to be successful. And that would include how they adjust the content for your time zone. Thank you. Uh, Andre Stevens, is it possible to come on campus to study or do schoolwork at the library or in some of the study rooms in the dorms? Yeah, th thank you for that question. And unfortunately, not, not at this time. Um, actually, we do want you to study. Uh, unfortunately, you can't study on campus at this time. Uh, we are still considered a closed campus, as you heard earlier from Dr. Corey and even Chief John mentioned this. And so um, there'll be some, uh, again, it's likely, we're not certain yet, um, that we'll be open for some pickup activities um, from the library, let's say. Uh, but at this time, um, we can't have students on campus studying. Um, of course, if, as things change and we hear um, of that news, we will let you know and invite you to the facilities to study. So thank you. 
Great. Uh, this question is for Lee Wilhite. Will you be able to help out with aid to those who have had a loss of income due to COVID for the spring 2021 semester as well? I'm thankful for the help I received for the fall. Well, we're, we're pleased to have been able to provide the help to you. And the answer is yes. Uh, we do have some additional funding available through our Hope and Crisis Scholarship Fund for spring 21. So if you've been in, uh, family's been hit exceptionally hard, especially hard during this time, maybe loss of income as the question posed. Thankfully, with the, just the outpouring of support of so many of Biola's donor community, we've got funding sitting there, much of which we've awarded out already, but we're gonna hold back some of that funding for families that, uh, that can really use it. So yes, there's gonna be some funding available in spring 21. Go to our coronavirus website, click on the Hope and Crisis Scholarship Fund, and you can uh, apply for funding that way. Thank you, Lee. Um, this question is for Chief John. Can Biola allow students to be able to use the Biola track, especially for student athletes within the area? Uh, well, as a, as a former athlete, you know, myself, I would love to say a, a big oh yes to this question. But uh, unfortunately, we are unable to do this at this time. Uh, we are hoping that the county actually reinstate one uh, particular provision that may give us the opportunity at some point, even if we are not allowed to re fully repopulate our campus as of yet. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Dr. Corey, and there's been a number of uh, similar questions in the live chat. So people will find this helpful. UCLA and other California schools are allowing apartment housing. Why can't Biola? Is it possible to maybe fight the state on this issue? I've seen that UCLA is allowing students to live uh, in on-campus housing. And I was wondering how is this possible if Biola has been instructed by LA County not to allow any students except for nursing majors to reside on campus? Okay, all right. Now, there's a little bit to this question. So just bear with me for a couple of minutes. And, and I can't speak for other colleges and universities, but let me, I can say this, we have not received permission from Los Angeles County to resume classes or residential life. So we haven't received that, um, that permission. This is true not only for Biola, but for all colleges and universities in LA County. So according to the State Resilience Roadmap, which is available, you can see it, higher education cannot repopulate until we get to stage three. And that happens when certain metrics like rates of infection, open ICU beds reach a certain level. So for almost all of California, uh, we are not at these levels. And if you look, this is the current order. The current order says, in-person higher education should remain closed statewide. You can see that on the covid19.ca.gov website. It was last updated July 17th. So this is the standing order of the state. Now, we've made a decision at Biola that until we know we have permissions to repopulate the campus or to, you know, to begin in-person courses, we are bound to abide by existing guidance. And we're not doing this just because it's the right thing to do, but we're also doing this because we don't wanna tell our students that you can move on to campus and then reverse that decision when the state issues its directives. Uh, we've all had enough of COVID whiplash, right? And this would be very unfair if we said, yes, you can come. And then we say, oh, actually now you have to leave. So we're erring on the side of doing what we see is clearly stated in the state and county guidelines now. And I know that there are some colleges that seem to be welcoming all or some or, or many of the students to live on campus. And some of these are outside of LA County. And you know they may be working on some special waivers in the respective counties, I don't know. But I still don't see how this is possible, frankly. Athletes are showing up on some campuses, but I am aware of no permissions by the state for athletes to actually be on campus. Uh, and I'm aware of most existing policies at the county state level, because I've been involved in these discussions um, pretty thoroughly. Um, but I just don't think it's a good thing to make an announcement ahead of state guidance. And we've been waiting for state guidance. Um, again, I've been at the heart of these conversations at the state level. I've been with the governor's office. I've been, I chaired the LA County um, reopening of colleges and universities. And um, I talk daily to other college presidents. Um, so I, I see what's happening statewide. Uh, I know the directives in, are in place and, and I think they are, you know, the directives, you know, are 
probably not where I wish they were, but they are what they are. It's very frustrating for us. Some of you actually may have seen that yesterday, uh, USC undid its decision to have uh, 10 to 20% of classes in person. And they, had, they undid their decision to have students living in their residence halls. They undid it yesterday after having made um, progress in that direction. And here's exactly what USC said. Uh, and they're also, by the way, in LA County. They said, quote, this is yesterday. Unfortunately, with the start of classes less than two weeks away on August 17, we do not yet have clearance from the state or county to move forward with classroom instru instruction. Given the delay in receiving the required permission, we have made the difficult decision to begin the fall semester with fully remote instruction with limited exceptions for clinical education. And then they want, went on to say this about housing. We have not received permission from Los Angeles County to resume residential life. We're currently working to support students who are at risk should they be unable to reside on campus. So that decision was reversed by USC. And we don't want to be in that position where we make an announcement, yeah, come and live on our campus and we'll populate our apartments and, and then have to say, no, we're not going to do that after all of the work and effort and emotional energy that you as families and students have placed on that. So, um, you know, we are all in the same boat on this. And I would not want to be a college that is building hope uh, that students can come back to live or study only to be told later by government authorities that they can't. That seems tremendously unfair to students and families in our community. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope I hope this helps, and I hope you know that um, we've been following this very very uh, closely, and we're erring on the side of when we do welcome you back, we will know that we can, and we'll do that without having any worry of retracting that decision. Thank you, Dr. Corey. Um, this is for Andre Stevens. Is there any service or advice for students who left items in a storage locker, uh, I'm assuming last semester, and need access to them again for the fall 2020 semester? Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, for students who had to store their belongings on campus in the spring uh, as we vacated, you can contact the undergraduate housing department um, to schedule an appointment to retrieve your belongings. Uh, in the next week, we'll be sending out an email with specific details uh, to students, again, who uh, stored their belongings. So you'll have specific details about that and the process uh, for retrieving your uh, belongings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this question's for Dr. Corey. It was a pre-submitted question, but we have a number of people also asking it in the live chat. So is there a possibility that school will open for in-person classes during fall semester? How would that look? And what is the deadline for bringing students back on campus for the fall if LA is past phase two after August 31st? Will the school be open for in-person? Yeah, so um, again, we are waiting to be granted permissions by government guidelines and they could come from the state any day now. I know they've been saying that for three weeks um, and you know, my little soapbox is that virtually every other industry in the state has guidelines to reopen except higher education. And it is extremely frustrating and we are growing increasingly impatient. But just so you know, when we do get these guidelines, um, uh, we're gonna assess how we repopulate our campus, how we phase students back in. We're certainly gonna do it consistent with the guidelines, but also consistent with Biola's high level of educational and safety standards. And, and we'll, be we'll be determining um, who comes back when, how we phase that in. Um, if the guidelines um, say that we can repopulate our campus and it's, let's say after October 1st, that seems to be uh, a date that we have in mind. So if we get permission to repopulate the campus after, after October 1st, you know, it would be very difficult for us um, to execute a phased in campus reopening, given that we're gonna be concluding the on-campus semester uh, right before Thanksgiving. Um, so, you know, even though the semester is going to continue, remember, until December 11th. So uh, it's going to be very hard for us to repopulate the campus if we don't get word until the early part of October that we can. At that point, we'll probably have to wait until the spring. Thank you, Dr. Corey. Um, this question is for Andre. Will there be RAs in the fall and how will it work? Will RAs be compensated for any work that they do to reach out to the residents on their floors? Yeah, thank you, Brenda. We would love for our RAs to work for free, 
Uh, but we're not going to do that. We are going to actually compensate you uh, for your work. Um, yes, we will have RAs. Um, they work approximately 10 or so hours a week. Um, the RAs will do what they do. They connect with their residents. Uh, this time would be done uh, virtually. They participate in leadership meetings with their uh, resident director, their RD. And again, we'll provide virtual programming and education in a variety of ways uh, during the semester. So we're looking forward to engaging them again. And again, they're peer, peer leaders on our campus. So we're excited to um, have them back. Thank you. Thank you. And this question is for Dr. Taylor. Why um, are we still getting charged for uh, class fees when we're not using campus facilities? Thanks, Brenda. Yeah, so let me just say there are a lot of different things going on with class fees. And I can't say that I'm an expert down to every single class, but I have learned there is a great deal of variety about how it's determined that there's a fee for the class. And so I have asked all of our departments to reevaluate them in light of the fact that we're beginning the year remotely. And I'm beginning to hear back from some of them. Um, so some of the class fees I can tell you are being used and kind of repurposed to provide access to materials. So for to, example, today, one of the art faculty told me that they've ordered supplies that they've accommodated for the online learning and they're actually shipping those directly to students' home. So that, that class fee is actually resulting in things that will be delivered to the student. And then because we know that it's pretty likely that we'll be able to check out the CMA equipment through the curbside delivery, the fees will help subsidize the maintenance of that equipment, which is what it usually does. But also we have to meet some newly developed sterilized protocols when we pass equipment from one student to another. So as you can hear, there's just a lot of variety depending on the discipline and the individual course. But if you have any questions or you have a concern that there's a particular fee and it doesn't make any sense for you to how it would apply for the fall, I'd encourage you to reach out to that academic department and I'm sure they can provide an answer to your question. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, this question is for Lee. Um, my question is whether our financial department would consider allowing the scholarships uh, to cover international students' housing expenses in addition to their tuition. Yeah, thank you for the question. So for undergraduate students that have already had their tuition expenses fully covered from financial aid, uh, you can in fact apply for the Hope and Crisis Scholarship funding I was mentioning earlier uh, to assist with off-campus costs. So uh, that is available to you if you're an undergraduate student. Because the Hope and Crisis Scholarship Fund is only aimed towards undergraduate students, graduate students unfortunately cannot apply for these funds to uh, offset their off-campus housing costs. So uh, if you're an undergrad student and your tuition fully covered and uh, you uh, still need some assistance, you can apply for that. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not available to our graduate student population. Thank you, Lee. And that's uh, all the pre-submitted pre questions. However, there have been a number of questions in the chat. Uh, we did answer some uh, because they were similar to the pre-submitted. There's one that was recurring and I'm gonna ask Andre Stevens to answer this one. One of my favorite things about Biola is the two conferences each semester. I was so bummed when missions was canceled last semester. Will there be a Tory conference this semester? And thank you for that question, Brenda. And it's also one of my favorite things about Biola as an alum. I remember being at Tory and at missions and uh, both of those uh, experiences were transformative. And so um, Tori will be, I believe, in its 84th year. And so it's a rich, rich, rich um, tradition and experience of Bible teaching um, at Biola. And for you new students, it's uh, three days long, Wednesday through Friday, typically, um, with uh, deep Bible teaching. And, um, and so this year, again, because of COVID and we're not able at this time to repopulate the campus, we've changed the academic calendar, as you know. Um, Tori will continue, but it will be in a different format. Um, we will have sessions throughout the week that Tori was scheduled. You will be able to access those schedules um, and, uh, and those sessions. Uh, details are still being worked out by Mike Ahn and a Tori team um, in planning. So we will have Tori. It will look a little different. Uh, we still expect it to be a rich experience of Bible teaching and learning. Um, that is true to Biola. So thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for 
uh, tonight. Thank you, Andre. And so that's all the time we have to answer questions. But there were a number of questions about uh, labs, and we're going to update our FAQ. A lot of the questions that were asked in the live chat are also in the FAQ. So please be sure to check that out on the Biola uh, coronavirus website and just click on FAQs, and you'll be able to uh, sort through them by categories. And we'll be sure to update it with some of your questions you posted today. So we're going to transition now to Lee Wilhite, who will close our time uh, in a word of prayer. Thank you, Brenda. And thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. For the hundreds and hundreds of you that stood with us all the way to the end, thank you. Hopefully this time tonight was helpful for you. It certainly was beneficial for us to spend it with you as well. So, hey, before I pray, let me just give a quick, uh, a quick plug. This coming Monday, August 10th, our very own Dr. Barry Corey is going to be uh, guest, a guest appearance on the Focus on the Family radio program. Uh, and so we would encourage you to tune that in. The topic is going to be helping your young adult thrive in college, a very appropriate time. It actually stems from a book that he recently wrote, uh, Make the Most of It, A Guide to Loving Your College Years. Um, and he wouldn't do it, but I'm going to uh, just uh, promote on his behalf this wonderful radio broadcast on Monday. We understand it's going to be streamed live. Uh, on their episode page of their website. It's going to be on YouTube as well. But if you want to hear Dr. Corey say uh, some wonderful things and counsel for uh, uh, young people as they approach their college years, tune into that episode this Monday on the Focus on the Family radio program. All right, with that, let me close this in prayer tonight. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, what a gift, what a privilege tonight to be with these students and families, Father, people that we care so deeply about. Uh, I'm just so thankful that we are united, Father, tonight. We have a common bond in Jesus Christ. I thank you so much for the privilege it's ours to have spent time with them tonight. I pray it was helpful. And I pray, Father, in the days and weeks to come that you would help solidify even further uh, some of the questions, some of the things that they're processing as they finalize their decisions for this fall. We're certainly looking forward to welcoming them virtually this fall. And we can't wait, Lord, to be back in person as community again. Uh, we just thank you so much, Lord, for providing for us, even in the challenging times. Father, even in the times of suffering, we know that we use this, you use these times to grow us in our faith, to test our faith. And so we pray, Father, that even through this pandemic, we would continue to be mature and we would grow uh, in you and we would um, experience uh, the fullness uh, of your love and your hope in Jesus Christ. And so tonight, Father, I pray a blessing over these families and these students. I pray, Father, you go with them tonight and in the days and weeks to come until we can gather again, August 31st, uh, to welcome them to the start of an incredible new year ahead of us. We thank you, Lord, and thank you again for our time tonight. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, uh, Lee, and thank you all again for joining us. Um, this is Biola. You know, biblical foundation, Christian development, spiritual and character formation, vocational preparation, intellectual growth, life and community. Uh, this is who we are. And this is why we're investing in our students um, so that they have a faith that prepares them for life and upholds them to death. And that's, that's the ball game. So uh, this, is the, um, this is what we get up for every morning. And we're so looking forward to seeing you students uh, very, very soon. Thank you all for joining us, participating in this town hall. I hope and pray we've really helped you with your questions. And again, submit your questions and we'll do our best to answer the ones that we didn't get to this evening. This is the last installment of our summer town halls, but I hope to see you um, on Zoom as I pop in on a class or two throughout the fall semester. And remember again, to send your questions in to help us with our FAQs. Um, and we'll do our best to answer your questions directly and post the ones, uh, the answers to the ones that are coming in on a recurring basis. So internal dot communications at biola.edu and we'll make sure it's answered as soon as possible. I am so grateful for each and every one of you students. I can't wait to see you uh, uh, in the virtual classroom. Then I can't wait to see you here on campus. Um, uh, you are beloved, you are special. God's got a great plan for your life. So. Thank you. God be with you. Stay safe. Stay healthy. We love you. We truly do. Go in peace. And goodbye now.